pray that you bless this. Thank you for another opportunity to get behind this pulpit and to preach thy word. I pray that you bless the congregation and all that are here, all that will be listening. Bless the words of my mouth, Lord. Meditation of my heart, let it be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our, my strength and my redeemer. I pray that you bless the Sunday school kids. And uh, just, again, we thank you for the opportunity to meet today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the children can be dismissed. All right, we're going to go ahead and get some passages here. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the kingdoms of the world and the rulers of those kingdoms being liking, likened unto beasts, likened unto beasts. I had prepared this a while back, as well as some others, and I kept looking at it. This morning, I got up and I did some finishing touches to it and added a couple things, but uh, usually leaders and kingdoms will be likened unto birds of prey or predatorial animals, okay? And the reason why is because, of course, they're dominant and strong and they hunt. You know, you wouldn't liken a kingdom really to a sparrow, would you? Or a ruler to a sparrow. But you might liken the ruler to an eagle because an eagle is majestic and an eagle is strong and an eagle is not afraid of other birds. So when you think about a ruler, land animals, you wouldn't really liken the ruler to a raccoon, but you might liken the ruler to a leopard because a leopard is majestic. A leopard is a hunter. A leopard is strong. A leopard is fierce. God does that. In fact, God likens men to beasts all the time. And in the scriptures, and I have a bunch of verses on that, that I could share with you today if I get time. But I want you to turn to three particular passages. Two are in Proverbs and one's in Daniel. I want you to go to Proverbs 21 and Daniel 2. Proverbs 21 and Daniel 2. Now, one, one out of the ordinary likened to a ruler is when Jesus likens Herod to what? To a fox. And that's the only time I believe in the Bible where a ruler is likened to a fox. Now, anybody have any idea why he called Herod a fox? Wisdom? And wisdom? Well, foxes have some wisdom, but what are foxes known for? being wily, being sly, okay, being sly. And as you said over here, he likened Herod to a fox. Now, the reason he did that is because he likens Jerusalem to chickens. You ever, you ever look at this? Jesus <clears throat> likens Jerusalem to chickens and himself to as what? A hen. I don't know if you've ever thought about Jesus as a hen. But he says to Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered thee as a hen gathereth her chickens? The reason he calls Herod a fox, let's get the correlation here. Why does he do it? Now that I shed a little bit of light on it. He calls him a fox because he's sly, but he calls him a fox. Why? Because Herod is out of place. Herod is out out to destroy the chickens. You get it? Christ is there to protect the chickens as a hen would protect. So basically what it's saying is Herod is in the chicken coop. And Jesus is say, saying, go tell that fox. He doesn't belong there because his intentions are not noble. A fox does not belong in the chicken coop. Because what happens? He eats the chickens. He destroys them. So there's a bit of prophecy in that. It's pretty neat, isn't it? Because you just say, oh, he's just liking himself to a hen with the chickens. No, there's more to it. 
he calls Herod a fox, stating basically, I'm the king, the protector, king of the Jews. Get it? Well, it's beautiful, isn't it? You're not king of the Jews. You might be in name, but you don't care about these people. Very prophetic. So rulers as beast. Okay, let's go to Proverbs chapter 21 first. And then we're going to jump over to Proverbs 28 as well. Proverbs 21, verse number one. And I, I talked about this the other day about the heart of the ruler. Wednesday service. <clears throat> this was my text verse. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. <clears throat> so God is in control. When we think about Oh, the world this and the world that. God never told us to pray for the world, did he? <clears throat> In fact, he said contrary. Don't pray for the world. The world system is going to be what it is. And it's going to go the way it goes. God wants us to pray for the rulers, but not for the world. So don't lose sleep praying over climate. Don't lose sleep praying over the condition of the present world. Just don't lose sleep over it. Because God said, don't worry about that stuff. He takes care of that. It's all in God's control. So just don't worry about it. God's in control. Now he says over here in Proverbs 28, and you'll see God compares rulers to beasts, namely what beast? We had fox, but that was an odd one. Okay. Lions. What else? Rulers compared to beasts. What kind of beasts? Lions. What else? What? Not a bull. Remember, predatory animals. Lions. Leopards. Bears. Eagles. Wolves. Okay, they all take and like blood, don't they? They kill, but they also protect. Jesus Christ himself is likened to a lion. Okay, the devil is likened to a lion. The devil is likened to a wolf, a lion. Okay, so these kind of things. God, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 15, as a roaring lion and a ranging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. Okay, so a ruler who won't take care of his people, especially the poor people, the Lord says he's like a roaring lion and a ranging bear. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 2. And let's look in verse 19. All right, Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Now look in 21. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So who rules in the kingdom of men? God does. So when man thinks he's in charge, man's not in charge at all. This is more spiritual than people think it is. What's ruling the world today is not really who's sitting on a throne. What's ruling the world today is what is behind the ruler. And what is behind the ruler? Spirits. So what men deny and men deny, a lot of people deny the spirit world. A lot of people deny angels. A lot of people deny the presence of Satan. 
A lot of people deny <clears throat> all these unclean spirits in the world. A lot of people deny that there is a God. But in reality, that king that sits on the throne is dictated to one way or another by the spirit world. And God sets one up and he puts down another. God let Saul be king. But Saul didn't cut the mustard. And the Lord said, I have removed Saul from being king, basically. I have picked someone after my own heart. Someone that, and he told Samuel, he said, I've rejected Saul. Go anoint David. And don't look at his stature. But anoint the one that I shall choose. Because God says, he didn't see as man sees. Man looketh on the outward appearance. The Lord looketh on the heart. Okay? So, God sets one up. He puts another down. Speaking of Saul and Jonathan, actually, 2 Samuel chapter 1, 2 Samuel chapter 1, the Lord likens them to eagles. We're going to look at the eagle first. 2 Samuel chapter 1 who in the Bible is likened unto eagles. Second Samuel chapter 1, the Lord says of Saul and Jonathan, they were like eagles and lions. Second Samuel chapter 1, this is David speaking actually. Second Samuel chapter 1 and verse 17, and David lamented with this lamentation over Saul, and over Jonathan, his son. So it's David speaking here. It says in verse 22, from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives and in their death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Okay, so we have Saul and Jonathan being likened unto eagles and unto lions. Now, there was another king in the Bible who was actually likened to, a, to an eagle, and he was actually changed into a bird of prey, actually, uh, and that would be Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4, Okay, Daniel chapter 4, and it says in verse 33. Uh, let's go a little bit, a little bit before that. Let's look in verse 30. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? What's the danger of saying too many mys and too many eyes? You forget God. And I, I preached on this Wednesday about our country in America. We're, we're quickly forgetting God. And when you forget God, it becomes dangerous. It's dangerous for the leaders. It's dangerous for the people. It says in verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and look, giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And of course, his understanding came back to him, and his counselors and those of his kingdom sought for him, and God restored him. So think, God can do what he wants with a ruler. And in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was greater than the other kings. When it talks about the kingdoms, 
and he sees this image. The image's head is made of what? Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He sees this giant image, and it's the image of a man. And its head was made of what metal? Gold. And its chest, thorax, down in here was made of silver. And then down through here in his loins, it was made of brass. And then we go down to the legs, and they're made of iron. Then we get down to the feet, and they're made of iron mixed with miry clay. So what do we have? We've got an image. We have a dream. We have head of gold, silver, brass, iron, iron mixed with miry clay. What did I just do with the metals? Okay, we got two different things. I heard they got stronger as we went down. True? If I take iron and I hit it against brass, which metal wins? Iron. If I take brass and I hit it against silver, which metal wins? Brass. It's harder, right? If I take silver and I hit it against gold, what wins? Silver. But on the contrary, what have I done? Gold, silver, brass, iron, iron mixed with miry clay. I've got less value. So when he interprets, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. So what was the greatest of the kingdoms in the eyes of the Lord? The head, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. You're the most costly. You are the most worth your kingdom of all these kingdoms. Now, it didn't say it would be the strongest, because as you go down, they get stronger and stronger. Okay, so we got this. It was God who reestablished Nebuchadnezzar. And in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, you'll see that if you read through Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar repents of some of the things that he does. And God really deals with Nebuchadnezzar a lot. And I've been asked this question, do you think, Pastor, do you think Nebuchadnezzar's in heaven? Well, he came to know the Lord, didn't he? God revealed himself to Nebuchadnezzar. It would sure seem that through all this and knowing Daniel and working with Daniel, that even with this here, God drives him, and then all of a sudden God restores him. You would think Nebuchadnezzar would be in heaven. Darius is the other one. You think maybe he went to heaven after Daniel in the lion's den and all that happened there. I don't know. Interesting stuff, but uh, you got these kings and their kingdoms likened unto animals. The kingdoms are likened unto animals as well. If we go to Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> all right, Daniel chapter 7, and let's look in verse number 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, the great sea there probably is the Mediterranean. If you've ever wondered what the great sea, it's actually called the great sea, isn't it? Mediterranean Sea, or the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea divers one from another. So all of these kingdoms would be in the Mediterranean area. And they would come up out of the great sea. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast a second, like to a bear. So the first is a lion. Second is a bear. And it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. So the kingdoms here are likened to beasts. Lion, bear. Six, after this I beheld and lo another like a leopard, 
which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them one little horn, another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So if you're wondering what that little horn is, anybody have any guesses? That's Antichrist, and that's future, okay? Now, we can, we can put this in prophecy and say these are four kingdoms that will come, but they also were four kingdoms that were already, okay? And if you read the different commentators, there are two schools of thoughts on this, and I've talked to many of you about this, and it's hard for me to commit to one or the other because I see both points. If you read Clarence Larkin, he's going to tell you the lion is who? Is Babylon. If you read Dr. Ruckman, Dr. Ruckman's going to tell you the lion is who? Persia. Now, who is it? You say, well, why do they teach differently? Because of one verse. And the verse says this. Daniel is speaking this here. And Daniel says, these are four beasts which shall arise. And Dr. Ruckman says, right there in that verse, what kingdom is already in place? Babylon. So Dr. Ruckman says, if Babylon's already in place, Daniel is saying these are four beasts, these kingdoms that shall arise, meaning their future. So therefore, it's not Babylon as the lion. Because if it's future, then it has to be the next one that takes over after Babylon, which would be Persia. Larkin, on the other hand, says, this is Babylon, which is the lion. Then the bear, which comes up next, the bear's next, right? Bear, would be Persia. Uh, then the leopard, and this is a teaching that I've had all my life. The leopard would be who? Greece and Alexander the Great. Now, history bears it out that it seems that Greece would be the leopard. Because you've got what? What comes off the leopard? He has what? Well, he has spots, but in this particular case, the leopard has what? Four wings. Doesn't it? Let's look. It says in verse 6, After this I beheld and another, lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given to it. Would history bear that out? Yes, it would bear it out if the leopard was indeed Greece because Alexander the Great, if you know him, he died at a very young age, okay? Alexander the Great died at the age of 33. And it's interesting because Christ died at the age of 33. And Alexander the Great is likened a lot to the Antichrist. He's the king of Greece. But God doesn't pay Alexander the Great much mind in the Bible because he doesn't even mention his name. If Alexander was so great, why didn't God put his name in the Bible? But he didn't. He left it out and he only calls him the king of Grecia. The king of Grecia is, I'm going to give you two animals. You tell me which one. A he-goat or a ram? You know your Bible in Daniel, you have this ram that has a horn, and it has another horn, and that second horn is smaller than the first horn. So this ram is an awkward-looking thing 
with one big horn and one smaller horn. What's that? That ram with one big horn and one smaller horn is what kingdom? Anybody? Ah, oh, Pastor, it's too early for you to pick my brain like this. What are you doing? Not Rome. Okay, let's think about the ram for a second. The ram goes around the earth and smashes everything to bits. It takes over the kingdom, becomes the primary kingdom until this he goat comes and this he goat's got this horn between its eyes and it sees the ram and it's moved with collar, the Bible says, against the ram and they go at it. <sighs> And which one wins? Which one wins? That he goat or that ram with the ugly or with the weird, weird horns? They go at it. Which one wins? I'm going to say the winner, and it's not even close. Which one wins? Who says the ram wins? Who says the he goat wins? Okay, so those that say the he goat wins, who's the he goat? Greece. Remember the horn? Alexander the Great. Okay, so let's figure out prophecy here. God has showed us who's the ram. The ram is Medo Persia. Now, the reason, okay, Pat, let's break this down. Why the two horns in different sizes? Because one is the Medes and the other one's the Persians. It was an empire that was run by two separate kings. You ever read in Daniel and you see he was king of the Medes? And then you got king of the Persians, namely Darius. And who else? God named him by name before he was born. Cyrus. So you got two kings, okay? One is over Media and the other one is over Persia. And they take over for Babylon. Okay, so when Nebuchadnezzar and Bel Belteshazzar, remember? Belshazzar, the king. Bel not Belteshazzar, that's Daniel. Belshazzar saw the writing on the wall. Remember that? Who conquered him that night and killed him? He was Babylon. Who conquered him that night? In fact, they got into a city where you couldn't get into. You know the story? Babylon was a city that no one could get into. It was absolutely, it was kind of like Jericho. You couldn't get into it. How did the Babylon, how did the media Persian forces get into Babylon? Anybody know history? Come on, Jimmy, you're a history buff. What did they do? Every city needs water, doesn't it? So what they did is where the river came out from under the city, they were able to get the water to stop flowing. So they came in under the city. That night was Belshazzar, was Belshazzar king of the of Babylon killed. And that night, right after the writing on the wall, Sa uh, Darius, Darius takes over, Medo Persia conquers Babylon. Okay? That's the ram. The ram, Media, big horn, Persia, smaller horn. Alexander the Great, likened unto the he goat, they fight. Now, if the leopard is indeed Greece, what are those four wings? There are four generals. Alexander died at 33. He had four sons, and they took over his kingdom. They didn't do a very good job of it. They weren't like him. Who took over after Greece? Rome. Rome takes over. Okay, Rome. So if we go the, the metals, we have gold, Babylon, 
We've got silver, Medo Persia, brass, Greece, iron, Rome. Rome was a very terrible, terrible, terrible army. Strong, so strong, stronger than all the rest. And then we see in the feet, we see iron mixed with clay. So we've got the legs of iron extending down into the feet, into the toes. But yet in the feet, it's mixed with miry clay. What's that? If iron is the leg, both legs, and it stands upon its legs, and the feet, and no one underestimate the feet of an army, an army will, will be destroyed when the feet go bad. General Washington had that problem with the American colonists and the army of the revolution. Their feet were starting to give in to the elements. They didn't have proper boots and stuff like that. And they were getting frostbit on their feet. Feet, very important. So the feet of this image holds it up. And where does the stone that's cut out of the mountain, where does it hit the image? It doesn't hit it in the head doesn't hit it in the chest. It doesn't hit it in the loins. It doesn't hit it in the legs. It hits it where? Right at the feet. So who's the stone? The stone is Christ. Christ hits the image in the feet, which tells you that has to be, that part of the image has to be around in the end time. So let's break it down. The head, gold. Who? Babylon. Babylon, second, made of Persia, silver. Third, Greece, brass. Fourth, Rome, iron. What's in the feet? Iron, who? Rome. And? Clay. What's clay in the Bible? Clay is flesh. We're not we made of clay? So, the seed of men. You got a weird union. Think about the unions today. Christ is going to smite a weird union because clay and iron do not mix. The Antichrist kingdom is going to be a weird, weird kingdom. Different than all the rest because it has clay mingled in with iron. Okay, so it tells you something else. That Rome is going to be back around in the Antichrist kingdom. And play a big part in that. And that links up to Revelation. Where God calls in Revelation. What does he call Rome? What does he call it? Mystery. Babylon. The great. And if you look and see. Where God talks about the kings. And he says the eighth. Is of the seventh. And goeth into perdition. So there were seven kings. And if you run those kings in the Bible, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven from the beginning all the way to the end. What was the beginning king? The beginning king was Babylon. If you run them all through, and trust me on this because I run them through, the first king is Babylon. Does nine have a middle? It's an odd number. So all odd numbers have a middle number. What's the middle number of nine? Five. So the first king is Babylon. The fifth king is Babylon. Okay. I'm sorry, seven, not nine, seven. Got ahead of myself. Seven and all not odd numbers. What's the middle number of seven? Okay. Now we're looking at four. My fault. Thank you, Samuel. First king is Babylon. Fourth king is Babylon. Seventh king is Babylon. Okay, seventh. 
Then an eighth king pops up, which the Lord calls him a horn. Okay? Horn pops up, and it says in Revelation that the eighth king is of the seven, but goeth into perdition. So what happens here is Rome actually goes into a mystery form. God knows it. And in the book of Revelation, Antichrist resurrects the Roman Empire, which if you study history, who tried to do that? It's all, already was tried. Who tried to do it? I just talked about him the other day and how, how the history channel is obsessed with him. Adolf Hitler. Hitler tried to resurrect the Roman Empire. Look at it. He tried to bring all back what was with Rome, even all of his symbols and everything. They would carry those banners around just like the Romans did. He wanted to reestablish a Reich. He called his the Third Reich, Rome. That's what he was doing. Antichrist will do it, and he'll resurrect it. Okay, so all of this in prophecy, and I was I, in this, I'm taking everything I just told you right from the Bible, am I not? Did I not give you all the Bible on this? Well, when you think about this, God gives all these symbols. And I just looked over there and saw the lamb on that painting over there. We can look at that lamb, that dead lamb, and know people might say, well, why do you got a picture of a dead lamb in your church? A lamb, a bloodied lamb. Because it's a symbol, isn't it? The preacher who drew that picture, and I would have, Pietro, if we could on Zoom, I would have you turn the camera and focus in, you know how they do that, and then little music played, <laughs> focus in on there, you know, for effect, and everybody would go, oh, like that, but we're not high tech like that yet, maybe one day, but anyway, we got the lamb, but behind it, we have on the mountain three crosses, and we can look at that as Christians, and we can easily see into that symbolism. What are we looking at? We're looking at the Lamb of God, are we not? That taketh away the sin of the world. So we look at it, maybe we even get a tear in our eye, and we say, wow, he, he did that all for me. He, who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, okay? Symbolism found throughout the Bible. And I've told you many times, the Bible is like a puzzle. We just take each piece and we try to put it together. And when they start connecting, all of a sudden, the puzzle begins to make sense. And as you connect these puzzle pieces together, all of a sudden, you begin to say, okay, now I understand. I've got a good understanding. This is what God meant when he said, that bear over there in Daniel, that lion in Daniel, that, that leopard in Daniel. This is what he meant when gold, silver, brass. Yeah, I get it. Okay, now I understand it. This is associated with, and let's, let's add another piece to the puzzle. How many toes does the image have? How many toes do we have? Ten. I hope so. I hope nobody said twelve. Because if you did, where would I run that back to? I'd run that back to, you're of the seed of the giants. Raise your hand. The six-fingered man, you know, the six-fingered man. As in the Princess Bride, if you've ever seen that movie, I will say to the six-fingered man, hello. You know, my name is Inigo Montoya, all that say six fingered man where to get that's of the seed of the giant six fingers six toes but that image has not 12 toes that image has 10 toes and what are those 10 toes what's the bible tell you they are 10 kings and where are they going to come we got antichrist we have this all getting fulfilled where's going to be the hotbed of his kingdom where his kingdom may be in and around jerusalem 
But who is he going to work with? Who are those 10 toes? They're European. So what you want to look for moving forward, you want to look for 10 European nations. And those 10 nations are going to sign an agreement with him. Okay? Those 10 nations are going to be the ones that support him. Now, if you break down Europe, and I haven't had a chance to really do it, but just take a look. 10 kingdoms that dominate Europe are going to be part of that. Now, it's not hard to think about the European nations that dominate Europe right now. Somebody throw a couple out. Well, Russia's not really European. Russians, England. And in fact, in fact, let's just do this real quickly. If I take those beasts and I make them future, which you can do because everything has a historic value, right? And things have a spiritual value as well. So if I took the lion and said, well, that's Babylon, let's just say Larkin is right here, is Babylon, that lion in the future was who? England. And then that bear pops up. What nation in the world is a bear? Russia. And what nation in the world would be the leopard? What? United States. What's a leopard? A leopard has three colors. Black, white, yellow. America. It's not completely Japheth, is it? It's not completely Ham, is it? And it's not completely Shem. We are a melting pot. And then you got the next beast that comes up. Okay, so you see the symbolism here? But when we think of Europe, we've got right now 10 nations. Let's just throw out possibly 10 nations. We got England. Who else is prominent in Europe? Germany. France. Say, well, France. France. And think about the languages all around the world. I was thinking about this so much the other day. When you think about Europe and where they are in the world, English is spoken around the whole world. As the saying said, the sun never sets on the English empire. What other language is spoken all around the world that might almost be as popular as English? Spanish. Think about how many islands and places around the world Spain conquered. Our neighbors to the south and Latin America, it's almost all 100% what? Spanish, except Brazil. And you say, well, that little area, Portugal over there, yeah, Portugal is just a small nation, isn't it? How big is Brazil? It's the size of the United States. Did you know that? And what language do they speak? Portuguese. Wow. A lot of influence, right? What other small nation has a lot of world influence in your Italy? They say, well, there aren't many places in the world that were conquered by Italy. Outside of, outside of Italy itself, where do they speak Italian? Anyone? If you say nowhere, you're probably right, because I don't know anywhere. <laughs> but you say, oh, yeah, they really don't. How many people in the United States spoke Italian at one time? And the influence that it had over the world. And its explorers. Okay? So, Spain. France. Another influential country. Half of our neighbors to the north. It's French Canada. You ever go to Quebec? That's French Canada. And what do they speak? They speak French. How about French Polynesia? And I, I believe that's French over there. What other small nation has a lot of world dominance when it comes to islands? Dutch. Thank you. The Netherlands. The Dutch have 
I believe, Dutch Virgin Island. And Dutch prison colonies and things like that were all around in these islands, and they spoke Dutch. Germany never had its many, because it was landlocked. It only had to the north. So they weren't adventurous like the Spanish, the French, the English, Portuguese, Spanish, Italians. They all had boats that went out and sailed. Christopher Columbus, right? What was, nationality was he? He was Italian, wasn't he? And how many other great Italians went around the world? Okay, so Europe, 10 kings, 10 nations, and those nations have power. And as those nations come up, Antichrist is going to use those nations. So France linked up with Quebec, possibly Portugal linked up with Brazil. You see, they're linking up with the world, and that's what the Antichrist is going to do. I don't have time to talk too much more about this. I, I've enjoyed this. I hope you have. I've thrown a ton of stuff out. I hope you didn't turn me off halfway through. But there was a lot of facts and a lot of Bible prophecy given to you in this, all because God uses symbolism to make nations and kingdoms and kings like beasts. So connect the beasts, and you'll put the puzzle, to, puzzle together. Okay? All right.